Thanks for um, having me. So where would you like to start on the inspection? Every inspector is different. I personally prefer to start on the exterior uh, for a few reasons. Number one, I have to draw a diagram of the property and I can do that from the outside. And then if I am on the inside, say in your attic, where I don't have a lot of orientation on where I'm at, it will help me determine where problems might be and where to go to from the outside. For instance, if I see termites in a rafter on the outside, I know to make sure I get into that part of the attic gotcha. to determine if they've made it on the inside as well. Okay, so let's get started. All right, so I'll start my drawing and then okay. any questions along the way? Yeah, if you're, ask. I'll ask some questions while you're drawing. Um, should homeowners do an annual termite inspection? Um, they should have a regular inspection. Annual for some homeowners might be excessive. Some companies will disagree with me. Um, and they, those companies typically do a lot of annual maintenances where they push these annual services. I'm under the thought personally for my company that if you're in a newer home, annual inspection might be a little aggressive. Uh, if you're in an area that you start seeing a lot of fumigation tents going up, then yes, an annual service could be beneficial to you. Uh, at the very least, get your home inspected at least, at least once every two years. Gotcha. And just so everyone knows, this is Kevin with Saddleback Termite. And typically what we'll do, most your termites are gonna start on the end cuts of the wood. So you're gonna see us poking around the end cuts. The reason for that is when your house was first built, it was framed up and painted after. So during original construction, there's usually no paint in between these cracks and crevices. Over time, the caulking will fail and that allows water and termites in. So that's why you're gonna see I'm focusing on those corners mostly. Gotcha. So during this process, as I'm poking and prodding around, I'm looking for the droppings to come fall falling out. Sometimes they'll roll out from between pieces of wood. And then in more advanced cases, I will uncover damage. The termites will eat sometimes right up to the paint and you won't see that it's there, at least not to most untrained eyes, until I start poking around at it. And then I have to determine how far that damage goes to decide if we're going to remove and replace that damaged area or if we're just gonna be able to patch it up. It also determine, helps me determine whether or not the house needs to be fumigated or locally treated. Uh, I don't make that determination until after I do the inspection. I don't fumigate everything. Um, I try, I try to treat each house individually and my recommendations will suit the needs of the property uh, on an individual basis. Notice most inspectors will make several passes over the same part of the property. For me, for instance, my first pass I was focusing on these eaves. Now I'm coming back to the same area and I'm focusing on ground level um, because that's where you're gonna find the termite droppings on times. And you have occasions sometimes where you'll have them coming out from underneath the weep screed in a stucco enclosed wall or a wood sided wall that you would otherwise miss if you're looking up. So you're gonna see me going back and forth making several passes. Um, one of the things we're gonna look for is if I find anything that's not necessarily just termite related, I'll let you know if you have, there's three types of termites that we deal with out here. There's different types of fungus that destroy wood. And then there's conditions that could lead to termites or fungus, which we would consider section two items in a escrow transaction. For instance, if you come back over here, you see water stains up underneath the eaves. Now, I'm not here to determine if that is an actual leak right now. I can't because we haven't had any real rain. It might be a water stain that's been there for 25 years. Or it could be from the gutter. It could be from the gutter. It could be from any number of reasons. Uh, sometimes the felt paper doesn't come to the edge. Uh, sometimes there's a backup in the gutter, like you mentioned. So uh, we'll make note of those items too and we'll call them out as a, typically a section two item. Now, if a moisture condition that would normally be a section two item has actually caused any fungus damage, then not only is the fungus damage a section one item, but the cause of it, which would be the leak in that situation. It could be a leak in your eaves, it could be a, a leak underneath your kitchen sink and the shelf rots out underneath it. Well, not only is the shelf a section one item that needs to be corrected for, a section one termite clearance, but also the cause of it. Uh, so at this point, this is just section two. There's no damage associated with it, but these are also what we look for during the course of a termite inspection. And section one is typically taken care of before the close of escrow. Section two typically is not. Some companies don't get up on ladders at all. Some of them don't even use probers that reach second story eaves. 
I try not to walk on tile roofs until I absolutely have to because I don't want to create more damage than you already have before I got here. But I will make an attempt to check out second story areas, invisible and accessible areas. But our responsibility is, at the very least, visible and accessible areas from the ground level. So do you recommend most sellers get a termite inspection before going on the market? Uh, it is not a bad idea. That way, for negotiation purposes, uh -huh. you uh, you know what you're dealing with going right. into it. And in the market that we tend to that we're in right now, as a very fast seller's one. market, yeah, a buyer might ask for a lot because they're paying top dollar for the house. Well, now you know what a lot's going to look like before you actually get right. into the transaction, and then you can negotiate and decide what you choose to do, whether it be some sort of credit or actually getting the repairs done. I have some homeowners, especially on homes that they've lived in a long time, that need a lot of work, and they'll decide to do the work and everything before they actually put it on the market. That way, they have a clear, uh, right. clear report ready to go. Uh, you'll still have to disclose that report in your escrow, sure. but there's no negotiation point. It's yeah. done. It's done. And it looks nicer when the buyers come and look at your house. At this point, there are termites here. As we're looking up here, the water stains, as we were discussing, you know, there was a, this is a newer rain gutter, so there was water that was coming around the area for a length of time. Uh, it caused the separation between the boards, which allows termites to get into the stuff. And again, this is where we start with the termites that are starting on the end cuts of the wood. So a right bit of damage right where I'm poking here. And then again, this rafter right here is also termite damage. This is what had fallen off when we probed at it. And you can see the termite droppings inside the board here. Great. These are dry wood termites. So it also stands to good reason with this amount of damage on that short of a rafter tail that the termites are extending up into the attic space. From this point, it appears to be an inaccessible area. I'll see from the attic space if I can get back up in here to treat it. If it's a vaulted ceiling, or a very shallow attic that we cannot access, then the primary recommendation would be a fumigation. Um, otherwise, we'll attempt to locally treat it. We could also do a local treatment as a secondary recommendation. It would be considered a secondary and substandard recommendation and it would state that in the report. Gotcha. Um, as long as, if this was an extra uh, situation, the buyer and seller are willing to accept that, then that's how we can proceed. That would be one of our options. Speaking of which, if, if this home were to be tented, does that mean all the neighbors need to tent their homes? Not necessarily. Um, I can't say when or where termites are going to set up shop, so to speak, and also a lot of that speaks to their uh, the level of maintenance that was done on the property. Uh, paint and caulking are going to be your number one lines of defense against termite infestation. That in conjunction with regular inspections, either annually or biannually, if the case may be. Uh, we'll be able to catch things at an earlier stage, but the paint's gonna be what keeps them out for the most part. So if this area didn't have this water condition and the paint, caulking was intact and the paint was intact, um, there would be much less of a chance that the termites would even have been here in the first place. Gotcha. So here again, a little more termite damage. It almost looks like maybe somebody patched it up before. I can't be certain. But as you get the separation in here from maybe it was water running down here before the uh, rain gutters went in, it allowed it access for the termites. So as you see, when you start poking around, you can see the little bits of damage where they're following the grains of the wood. But the damage doesn't go too far. I mean, where it's that severe, you can hear the difference when I'm tapping on yeah. it and what's hollow and what's not. It's kind of crunching. Yeah, so at this point. So would you say, one of the most important things an owner could do to prevent termites is to have a good paint job? A good quality paint job. Um, paint is one of those things you're going to get what you pay for. Uh, the quality of the paint makes a big difference and the quality of the painter. For instance, if you get a lower end painter who doesn't do all the proper prep work, even if he uses the best paint available, great paint will not stick to the wood well if you have layers of dirt in there. So you want a good painter that's going to come through and scrape everything down, power wash it, uh, whatever their process is, depending on the type of paint they're using. But you want to get clean surfaces, clean solid surfaces before you paint. 
So that's why it would be important to get a termite inspection done before you take on any major project. Mm -hmm. We're going to let you know what's solid and what's solid, uh, what not, what's not solid, and let you know if something needs to be replaced. Uh, then the painter's going to come through after we fix everything, power wash the rest of the house, and uh, then they'll do, they'll do the finish as far as uh, make sure you have good solid painted surfaces. All the corners are cocked and sealed properly. And um, side note is if a homeowner is not getting ready to do a full paint job at that time, we can also paint to match right. if you supply me the matching paint. Gotcha. Uh, a lot of the wood would get primed and painted on the ground level on soft horses before we would even install it. Uh, but in a situation like this, your options are, one, we could replace the wood, but that would unfortunately mean disassembling brand new rain gutters, which I'm not really excited to do that because you start taking them down and putting them up repeatedly, they don't ever go up the same every time. Right. So in this situation, I would say the damage is relatively minor. We can come through here and whether we fumigate it or locally treat it to kill the termites, we can dig out all the damage, fill it all in, texture it, paint it, and try to make it look like there was never a problem there. But then it'll be crucial to stay up on the paint to make sure right. that whatever repair gets done up here uh, is going to last. Uh, How we'll, often should a homeowner paint their house then? Uh, that is absolutely dependent on your location. Uh, here further inland, uh, I see you know roughly 10 years on a good paint job before it really starts looking like it needs to be addressed. It doesn't necessarily mean a stucco, but at least the wood trims. Right. Uh, now, if you're closer to the ocean, it could be five years. I see houses on Balboa Island that five to seven years, and they look far worse than a house here in Rancho Santa Margarita or Mission Viejo that has a 10-year-old paint job, just because it's under a lot more stress. So here again, we have another rafter tail where the termites probably start on the end cut of the wood up in here. So the damage is gonna be a little more severe here. And it's going to be a little less as we get back up to the wall. But then there's a good possibility that these termites are extending into the attic. And I don't know from the attic if I'm going to be able to access them. So we'll find that out when I get up there. So what about firewood or pallets or things around the house? Is that an invitation for termites to come on over? It absolutely is. Um, stored wood like this, you know, they're just unpainted, untreated lumber for fireplaces or uh, fire pits. Uh, they're just, uh, they're exposed to all the elements and sometimes they can have termites in it when you buy them or, it, or beetles or other wood destroying pests already in here. So you're, you're inviting them because there's no treatment on this. Like we talked about your house being painted to help protect it. There's no protection on here. Uh, we don't know when this tree got chopped down, where it got chopped down from or how long it's been here. So. There is an absolute possibility there could be an assortment of termites running through any of this wood already. Smorgasbord. Exactly. Now behind you, if you have a pallet on the ground resting against the ground, anytime you have any earth to wood contact, that is going to invite termite problems as well. Typically when you talk about earth to wood contact, we're talking more about subterranean termites. Uh, those termites live in the soil and come up to feed off the wood and return to the soil. Uh, subterranean termites will do way more damage in a short amount of time than dry wood termites will because those colonies can be enormous. Uh, the queen to this colony, if you had subterranean termites here, the queen to the colony could be a couple houses down and several feet underground. Wow. Uh, whereas if there was termites in this piece of wood, the whole colony would be living in that wood and whatever adjoining wood that it's touching. So that's why when we fumigate a house, we're killing all the drywood termites within that house. But for subterranean termites, we have to do a soil treatment. You know, we have to stop them at the ground level. Uh, now, the products we use for soil treatments, uh, we use a product called ter uh, Termidor, which the active ingredient is fipronil. What happens is the termites come in contact with that, they pass through the chemical barriers, and they more or less contaminate themselves with the pesticide. As the termites travel through their colonies, everybody's got a job to do. They groom each other and they feed each other and they keep passing on the termidor so that it will get passed on to the other termites in the colony. It could take several months to wipe out a large subterranean termite colony, but it's the most effective method we have for that right now. Um, now, we use the same product for drywood termites on local treatments, and again, it takes longer to wipe out the colony, but it is 
in my opinion, that's the most complete kill you can get with the local treatment. Uh, Terminor is not the only product out there with fipronil in it, but it is the most common and widely used. So Kevin, what do you look for on the inside of a home? On the, on the inside of the homes, we look for obvious signs of termites, whether it be termite droppings. Usually you'll find those maybe in the windowsills or around baseboards, door jam areas, uh, where there's obvious wood available. Uh, we also will check around for moisture conditions and water stains. Uh, one primary would be like underneath kitchens and bathroom sinks. We'll look under here to make sure nothing is leaking. We'll also investigate for any kind of standing water situation uh, or additional dry rot that might be in the cabinetry itself. Uh, and as far as uh, subterranean termites, drywood termites, we'll inspect for both of those as well as any obvious moisture or fungus infections. Hey Kevin, um, what about uh, shower pans? We do test all shower pans on first story shower pans only. Second story, we're concerned if there is a leak because of the finished ceilings below. But on a traditional shower pan, we'll stop up the drain and fill the bottom of the dam up to within an inch of the top of the dam and let that sit for about 15 minutes. And then we check the perimeter of the shower for any kind of water leaks, any moisture coming up. Sometimes air bubbles coming up around the grout is an indication that water is going down. Um, unfortunately, with some shower pans, they're just not practical to test in that manner because all the newer showers have these really long, wide drains or oversized showers um, with a lot of texture in the grout. It's hard to seal those up. But for the most part, um, whether it's a fiberglass shower pan or a traditional tile shower pan, we're going to test all of those on first story for our escrow transactions. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So I know you're going to go in the attic and you're going to be looking for the same things you found on the outside or? Yes. Yeah, so my focal point at this point in the inspection would be, I know we have termites on the outside corner and rafters. So I want to get to those areas and see how far those termites have traveled inside and how accessible it would be. Now, in this particular situation, it is not a vaulted ceiling, so there's a good chance I can get back to where those termites are from the inside. I won't know until I get up there, but that would be the plan. I'll also check the rest of the attic for any additional infestations. Um, again, as I mentioned, we have multiple types of termites in here. I'm also going to be checking for water stains, any kind of moisture conditions. Sometimes I could determine there's a roof leak from inside the attic. And sometimes it's as simple as uh, if the furnace is in the attic and there's condensation, uh, maybe the drain lines, the condensation uh, lines that are supposed to lead outside are jammed up and can cause some kind of leaking up in there. So any condition like that, I will notify a homeowner of that we see on the property. And my job is to get into as much of that attic as I can. So you're going to do the best you can, but there could possibly be hidden damage. Absolutely. Most attics have insulation, so I can't see underneath all the insulation and we're not going to pull all the insulation out. Right. Uh, uh, some attics I get into, homeowners have installed plywood across the ceiling joists to, for storage. Uh, and then they might even have a lot of stored items up there. So that all of that is going to uh, inhibit what I'm going to be able to see in an attic space. But we'll be as diligent as we can and try to cover as much as we can work there. In the event that there's an area that I cannot get into in an attic, uh, especially during an escrow transaction, I will mention that an area is inaccessible and I will explain why. Sometimes it's inaccessible due to the original construction or air ducts or insulation where it's not practical to make those areas accessible. But if it's inaccessible because the homeowner has a lot of storage up there, I may require that homeowner to remove that storage so I can come back at a later date and reinspect the attic and file a supplemental report. Now I'm around the chimney area and this is the flue where the heat and smoke go up, and right along that you know, are termite wings here. That is what that is. And a little more on the other side, right over here. So, we know termites have swarmed in to the attic, um, either through air vents or around the framing of the fireplace up here, which again, is an inaccessible area. I cannot get up in there to treat that without disassembling the chimney. So this takes me back to my primary recommendation of needing to fumigate a house because these termites could have burrowed into the wood up in here and I can't see where they're at. And as they burrow in, they drop their wings off. So what we see down below are the wings that I've dropped off of the termites. Each termite has four wings. There's more than one 
termite worth of wings under here, so we don't know exactly what that situation is. This is the rear left corner of the house where we identified a rafter tail from the outside that termites extended into the attic. As you can see, there's a lot of insulation up here and the area has been treated in the past and that's what all this white dust is everywhere. Is after a treatment has been done, typically a company will try to cover up or remove any evidence of the existing termites so that it doesn't get called out again as live activity in the future problem we have here is that there still are live termites here. Um, you can see everything's been covered up and there's still droppings right here. I will try to get some still shots that might come through a little better than this video. So at this point Kevin, what do you recommend for this homeowner to do? For this homeowner, the primary recommendation would be to fumigate the entire structure because you do have termites extending into inaccessible areas that I don't feel we can actually, without a shadow of a doubt, control without doing so. I don't think a local treatment is going to get all the termites out in one attempt. Now that being said, with the homeowner, uh, whatever their situation is, maybe they're not ready for a fumigation. Local treatment is still a very viable option at that point where focusing more on termite control. I might not get every termite out of here, but we can slow things down, get it under control, and maybe this is one of those situations where they might want to consider some sort of maintenance plan, or at least have the home inspected and treated every couple of years just to stay on top of it. Uh, after all the work is done, I would recommend you know, having a painter come through and sealing everything that's exposed, uh, caulking and sealing the corners, the end cuts power washing, getting all the old paint off that is ready to come off and getting a nice solid coat of paint on there. And I think uh, the house will be in, I, the house already is in great shape, but it'll be in much better shape for years to come. So this particular homeowner didn't realize that there were termites. What would someone be looking for to even think that there might be termites in their home? Is there? Yeah, well, there's more obvious signs on advanced stages where termites termites will swarm. They produce reproductives that fly, and that's how they get from house to house. Uh, so in an advanced situation, a homeowner might see termites flying around their house. They kind of look a lot like a large, like, like, like an ant. Um, to an untrained eye, it's very, uh, they're very similar. Uh, also, they might notice the droppings that I showed you from the attic or on a piece of wood that fell off the side over here of sure. that rafter. And you'll see those piled up in window sills or under a baseboard in different areas around the house. Uh, it'll be one of the scenarios where you'll clean it up and a few days later it's back again and it keeps returning and returning. Uh, and then eventually that colony will mature enough to actually produce reproductives that can fly. So, and then the, the final thing would be again, more advanced stages, uh, seeing the actual damage around the house. So mostly advanced stages for the right. untrained eye to see anything? Aside from termites actually physically swarming and right. flying around. And at that point, I urge a lot of homeowners that call me and that think they have a termite problem, they see bugs flying around, I say, take a picture, send me a picture. Let's see if what we're dealing with. Right. Because sometimes it is a swarming ant, sometimes it's not termites. And I can determine that before sending an inspector out because in my unique situation, because I cover both termites and general pest control, I want to make sure I send the right inspector out to the property to service that problem. Not every inspector is licensed in both fields of both termite and general pest control. So we want to make sure we get the right guy on the job. Gotcha. Kevin, you recommended fumigation as the number one thing to do. What, what does that entail? Fumigation is typically a three-day process. So what happens is once you determine there's a date that works for you to be out of the house, um, then we will bring you the fumigation bags, we'll schedule the date, we'll schedule the gas company to come shut the gas off for the morning of your fumigation. Um, you will have to bag up perishable food items. Uh, there are some bathroom items as well, and we'll give you a whole checklist of how to prepare for the fumigation, instructions on how to properly bag everything up. The morning of the fumigation, the crew will come out, they will inspect everything that you have bagged up to make sure everything was bagged up properly. They will be opening up all interior doors and also checking for any items that you may have missed. Uh, they will bag all that up 
and as long as you make a diligent effort, then they have no problem with having to bag up a couple of extra items for you. Uh, once the house is properly sealed and everything inside has been gone through, then they will introduce the gas into the property. And if you, then the gas is in there for the first day. Um, on the second day, the company is going to come back out again. The fumigation crew is going to come back out again. And there's going to be a tube, probably about this big, on your front of your house with a cap on it and a fan built into it. Uh, they're going to plug the fan in and pull the cap, and that's going to start the ventilation process, drawing the gas out of the house for another day. On the third day, the crew will come back again. They'll remove the tarp. They will have meters to make sure that the Vicane, which is the fumigant that we would be using on your property, is completely out of the building. Um, they'll go ahead and uh, remove their tarps, clean everything up, load up their trucks. They'll post a notice on the door that said it is safe for re-entry, and then you're okay to go back into your home. Um, by that time, you would have already contacted the gas company and scheduled the gas restore. So somebody will need to be here to meet the gas company so they can restore your gas. The gas company will check your connections and make sure everything's functioning properly. And uh, that's more or less the process. The only exception to the three-day process would be fumigating on a, incorporating a Sunday or a holiday, which would add extra days. So what would a homeowner do with plants that can't be removed around the house? Like for example, this tree is really close to the house. Would it, would the tent be able to go between the tree and the house? In many situations, yes. Uh, anything rooted basically within 18 inches of the house is subject to damage. Okay. Or if it's actually growing up onto the roof line or attached to the wall, those would need to be detached or removed or cut back. Uh, but the important thing is that we can get the tarp down between the house and the roots. In the event that we do have to cover a plant, it may sustain damage and depending on how hardy that plant is, it may or may not bounce back. More mature plants that have been there a long time, if you saturate the roots properly prior to the fumigation, okay. there's a good chance that they will bounce back. They might look a little rough for a while, but a lot of those will bounce back. Uh, if they're more like annual plantings or delicate flowers that get covered up, they may not. Anything potted like you have on your porch over here, I would say remove those and just be mindful. If it's something that needs to be in the shade, if you put it out in the direct sun, that might be problematic. Right. House plants inside the house, you just gotta be cautious where you put them, but they need to be out of the house, as well as uh, pets, pet food. Right. Uh, and even in, regarding bagging of perishable food items, uh, eye drops, mouthwash, toothpaste, medications, which a lot of that you would end up taking with you during, right. the, uh, during the vacating process anyway. Thank you. Sure.